glad to be here with you again this morning and to share with you uh, some great truths that we, we find when we turn to the Word of God. For those of you who uh, know me and know what I do as far as preaching is concerned, I'm uh, what people would normally call an expositional preacher. In other words, I, I preach through books of the Bible, and I do it that way because I, I want people to be educated and instructed. I want them to grow in their knowledge of the, the Word of God. I know a lot of preachers preach what we call topically. They just think about something that would be interesting for that week, and that's what they, some topic, or maybe a theme, you know. Well, occasionally I do do topics and I do do themes, but uh, generally I, I like to go through books of the Bible. And I'm, I'm hoping, beginning in the new year, uh, to do the book of Philippians in the morning and the book of Revelation at night, uh, because I really believe we're living in the last times. I'm seeing things, I don't know where you are, but I just see things weekly now that uh, line up with the Word of God and in instruct me and assure me that we're living in those days where I wouldn't be at all surprised uh, that uh, the rapture will take place. Um, and I, I just see the movement of nations, the movement of uh, uh, like a one world government. Uh, we call it the global economy. But if you know anything about these meetings that are being held, uh, talking about the global economy, it's really talking about a one world government. Um, and uh, it's quite amazing. And you probably heard recently that uh, uh, President Biden said, we need to get everybody to have a chip uh, that has their name on it and has all the medical records. So if anything happened to them in an accident, instantly we'd know uh, who they are and what their medical conditions are and we can keep a regular contact on exactly where they are. But you know, this chip is run by AI. You know what AI does? It operates your mind. <laughs> uh, the Bible said in the last days, we're all going to have a chip, and if you don't have the chip, you won't be able to buy or sell anything. And th these are interesting days in which we're living, and exciting days for those of us who are Christians. So in the new year, that's what I like to do. But of course, right now we've got Thanksgiving next week and then we've got missions right after that. And when we got Christmas, then we got New Year. So uh, I thought it wouldn't be wise to start uh, book studies right now because there'd be too many interruptions. And as I was praying and thinking this week about what we could uh, look at, what we could be uh, considering in the Word of God, the Lord led me to consider some Beatitudes. And, uh, you, you know, in the book of, in the Sermon on the Mount, there are eight Beatitudes, we call them. And they're found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, uh, first through 10. Just eight Beatitudes. Well, I, I want to take one this morning and tonight, next Sunday morning, and look at some of these Beatitudes because they're very, very important. And there's some extraordinary truths, unusual truths in Beatitudes that many Christians are <laughs> totally unaware of. And uh, that's unfortunate. But, we, but we're going to do that uh, today and then next week. So uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll have a look this morning at the second beatitude. Oh, that's the one I want to look at this morning. Uh, and then we'll look at the seventh beatitude tonight. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity of being here this morning. And I know, Father, that preachers can facilitate teaching, but they don't really teach. It's the Holy Spirit who's the teacher. So we pray, Father, that you would speak to us and teach us today some of these great truths that are found in the Word of God. Just guide us. We look at this uh, second beatitude, that, Lord, you would give us a mind that would be receptive to what you want to say to us about this uh, very special verse in the Bible. Now, I pray and ask these things, then, in Jesus' name, and for Jesus' sake, amen. Now, when we think about beatitudes, uh, I like to say this is the attitude that should be in every Christian. That's where you get the idea of Beatitudes. And we think of Beatitudes, and I'm going to look at, at verse 4, and this is the Beatitude that I want us to think about this morning. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, it's a very simple statement, and we could rush through that statement and not think very much of it. But that word blessed means greatly enriched. Greatly enriched those who mourn, those whose hearts are broken over their sin. Greatly enriched to those whose hearts are broken of the sin, and said, so they shall be comforted. Now, that doesn't mean to say somebody's going to hold your hand, put their arm around you, make you feel good. It means it's going to change the total direction of your life. So we could translate this, this verse 
greatly enriched to those whose hearts are broken over their sin because their lives are going to be changed and given a new dimension for the future. This, uh, of course, is the, the teaching of Jesus. And when we think about the Beatitudes, they're not just a great collection of great thoughts or great ideas. What the Beatitudes are really about is what we call progressive revelation. It's showing us more and more and more about the truth of what it really means to be a Christian. What it's really doing here. It's describing what a tr what true Christian character is about and how you get to have that kind of character. And so as we look at this this morning, one of the things that become very apparent is it's talking about what sin does to every individual. And it talks about the dangers, the damage, the utter destruction that sin has in the lives of every individual. This week, uh, Cynthia and I and our family have a ministry in Uganda. And for this week and next week, they're having a conference with pastors and teachers all over Uganda. And this week, I had the privilege of, of speaking uh, for two hours to this conference. I'm going to be doing it again this week coming up. But uh, I was speaking this week on evangelism. And in talking about evangelism, one of the reasons why I wanted to speak about evangelism and talk to these pastors and these teachers that are from all over Uganda is to say it's very important to, to tell people the truth. And the only truth is the truth that we find in the Word of God. It was Jesus who said uh, um, in John's Gospel 8, verse 32, He said, I want you to know the truth because only the truth, and you know what a definite article means, it means there's only one. I want you to know the truth because only the truth can set you free. Set you free for what? Well, first of all, from sin, and secondly, from hell. There's only one truth. Somebody has the truth. Now, there's lots of religions, but there's only one truth. <laughs> and this passage here, when Jesus was talking about, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, he's saying, listen, if you have never realize the consequences of sin, the damage that sin does, you're not going to seek after God. So in this passage here, I, I think there are three issues that I particularly want to point out this morning. I know there are lots of issues, but there are three that I want to point out to us this morning. The first one is what I would call the activation of spiritual brokenness. How is it that God works on your life? How is it that He acts on your life to make you realize how destructive sin is and how we need to, to do something about our sin. Well, very often, uh, very obvious, it's because of the work of the Holy Spirit. When Cynthia and I are driving over here this morning, Cynthia just, she didn't know what I was going to preach on, but she all of a sudden said, you know what? Isn't it amazing, the work of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit convicts us of inappropriate thoughts that we have and what thoughts we have become actions in our life. That's so very, very true. And so when you look at this verse here, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those enriched, greatly enriched are those whose hearts are broken over their sin. One of the things that becomes very apparent is that this consciousness of our sin. Romans 3.23 is a passage that most people know. And most people are very familiar with it. Most people uh, have memorized for all have sinned, everybody sinned, and come short of the, the glory of the standards of God. Now, when the Bible uses that word standards, you, you see it in the Old Testament and the New Testament, what standard is God requiring you to keep? What are these standards? What is this glory of God that God is going to measure your life? Everybody that stands before Him, it says, for all have sinned. Everybody's going to stand in the judgment room of heaven, and God's going to hold them according to the standard. What standard? What, what, what is the standard of measure? Well, some people say, oh, it's, it's measuring you against the person of Christ. Well, that, that's true. But that's not really what the standard is. If you understand the Hebrew and the Greek, you know what the standard is? It's the Ten Commandments. And the Bible tells us if you break one of those Ten Commandments and you only break it one time in all of your life, you're a sinner. And sin will keep you out of heaven because there's no sin in heaven. So how do people become aware of sin? 
Well, it's when they become exposed to the Word of God, when they become exposed to the teaching of God's Word. This isn't just a myth. One of the reasons that I know uh, that it's not a myth, I'm sure you've heard of a man called Sigmund Freud. Maybe you haven't, but uh, Sigmund Freud is the most famous psychologist. He, he was the man, basically, uh, that formed what we know today as psychology. He, he started, he was born in 1856, but he continued through to 1939, and he had an enormous influence on the world. The counseling, most counseling is based on the teachings of Sigmund Freud. Psychiatrists, their activity is, comes from this man, Sigmund Freud. But there's something very interesting about this fellow, if you know him. Now, he's an Austrian, he was raised in Austria, he was a Lutheran, he was brought up in a Lutheran church. He <laughs> knows the Bible, he knew the Bible very well, but he didn't accept the Bible. He didn't like what the Bible said because he said it was very restrictive. It made him feel bad when he th read things in the Bible, particularly when it related to his own life. But in one of his books, here's a man who was an atheist, didn't believe in God, didn't accept the Bible. Look what he said in one of his famous books. And if you've ever read any of his books on counseling, he, this is often in many of those books, he said, I want to talk to you about original sin. Original sin is a fact. Since psychoanalysis has revealed that the whole world practices this kind of villainy and sin. Many counselors have not suspected that this was innate in man, but it is. Even though its presence was clearly enough attested in the New Testament, said Sigmund Freud. Said he said, you know, it is written about in the Bible, though I don't agree with the Bible, I don't accept it. I did find it. One. And we might ask, is it not true of all human experience? Now, here's a man who's an atheist, but he's just saying, you know, it's even in the Bible. And I've noticed in, in my activity as psychologists and psychoanalysis uh, practices that I find, everybody has this problem, a sense of villainy, a, a sense of, we call it, sin. And so when we look at this verse, one of the things that we know when the Holy Spirit begins to work on an individual through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, what happens immediately? There's a sense of the consciousness of sin. But there's also, look at this verse again, Romans uh, 3, 23, also culpability and accountability for sin. For this is what this verse says, for all have sinned and they're all going to be held accountable for the sin. There's, there's coming a day of accountability. What happens when the Holy Spirit begins to work on your life or mine? When you hear the preaching of the Word of God, you didn't ask for it, you didn't think it was going to happen, but I remember the day that God spoke to my life and I thought, sin is real. I didn't think so. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I, I didn't have this kind of intention. I just lived for myself and I enjoyed what I did. And, and, and if I sinned and got away with it, nobody knew about it. I was very happy about it. But all of a sudden, in this meeting, when I heard the preaching of the Word of God, something said to me, Alan, you've been wrong. I became very conscious of sin. And I realized if this verse is true and if the Bible is true, I'm going to be held accountable for, for this kind of behavior. And there's, there's sensed in my life a deep sense of conviction. This verse says, for all have sinned and come short of the standards of God. So it's not like I can look down on you. I need to look down on myself because all of us stand in the same situation. And you know, I, I talk to a lot of people and I've witnessed to a lot of people and I said, do you think you're going to make it to heaven? And that many people say, well, I hope so. I, I've never done anything really bad. You know, I've never killed anybody. I've never robbed a bank. You know what they think? They think they're going to be measured by how many good things they've done. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says when you stand before God on that final day, He's not going to, he's not going to look and see how many good things you've done. He's only going to look at one thing, how many sinful things you've done. It's sin that keeps you out of heaven. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. It's very interesting that David, and you probably know this verse, but David in Psalm 51 verse 4 says this, Against you, you only have I sinned. Have I done evil in your sight? What is David saying? Well, God, the one that I have affected most by my behavior 
it's not my friends and my family, it has affected them, but the one who I have saddened the most is God in heaven. When Jesus was saying this, he said, listen, if God life in an effective way, there's got to have to be a sadness, a deep sadness for sin in your life. But not only there's going to be a consciousness of sin and a culpability and accountability for sin, but there's going to be a there are going to be consequences for our sin. You know, you, you, you've got to love Timothy, this young man that uh, Paul trained in the ministry. And we find that in 1 Timothy chapter 5, a very, very interesting verse uh, as Timothy is sharing some of the great truths that he's discovered about the Christian life. And this is what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 24. He said that, listen, this is a very interesting couple of verses. He said, the sins of some men are quite evident. They go before them to judgment. And for others, their sins follow them. In other words, he said, there are some people who sin, and you see it, and, and you, it's very clear. Others hide their sin and think they're getting away with it. But not in the eyes of God. Now look at the next verse. He says, and likewise also, deeds that are good are, are, are quite evident but those which are otherwise are not concealed from the eyes of God. Boy, this really speaks to each one of us of the terrible effects of our sin. It's interesting, as I was thinking about this this, this week, and I was looking in the Word of God about this this week, listen to some of the other verses talking in the Bible about sin. It said, John 8, 34 says, Sin will spoil our character and it will sear our conscience. 1 Timothy 4.2 says, it will contaminate our friendships. What is it that ruins the relationship between husbands and wives? What is it that ruins relationships between children and parents? What is it that ruins relationships between employers? The Bible said it's sin. But there's something else. There's others that it says, Romans 14 says, it will destroy your social life. There's a lot of people that have good relationships and all of a sudden those relationships sour. What happens? What causes that? It's sin. Sin has entered in because there's sin in the heart of every single one of us. You know, the thing that I find so disappointing, and I imagine you do too, is that Hollywood makes a joke about sin. Makes movies about sin. Laughs about sin. Justifies sin. Uh, tries to help you and me rationalize our sin. Why does it do that? Ah, oh, because it really knows the consciousness, the consequences of sin, and tries to cover it up and make it like it's make-believe. Don't be fooled by it. You know, one of the interesting things, this word mourn here in this passage is the word pentheo. It's not just, oh, I cut my finger and I'm crying over it. It's not, <laughs> that's not, the, that's not this word. You know what pentheo means? It means if you have a, a, a little child, maybe a four or five year old girl or daughter, and in some tragic way they die, do you laugh about it? Do you try to justify it? Do you joke about it? No, you don't. You mourn about that. That's this word. Listen, the people that God are going to use, according to what Jesus said in this passage, are people who have mourned, who have been broken hearted, over their sin. And they don't want to be that way anymore. You know, the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, writes some extraordinary things. Uh, you, you may not know this verse, but in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2, this is what he said, It's better to go into the house of mourning and weep than it is to go to the house of festivals and celebrate. The Bible puts a big emphasis on how you and I as Christians, if we're going to grow our character as Christians, we have to have a deep sense of restlessness and sorrow because of sin. But there's a second thing that he's talking about, not only how he acts in our life to make us aware uh, of what damage of sin would do, but how there is an operation, how there's a development and spiritual brokenness. Now look again at this verse 4. It tells us, Blessed, greatly enriched, 
of those whose hearts are broken over their sin. For their lives shall be changed and used or comforted and used in a great, a great, a great way. One of the things that uh, is very important when Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, you probably know that he wrote uh, two books to the, the church in, in Corinth. The <laughs> first Corinthians are writing them and telling them, he said, look, there's several things you need to correct in your life, uh, in the life of the church. There were moral problems, uh, financial problems. There was a disagreement about the word of God. And you know what happened in first Corinthians? They didn't do anything about it. So he wrote another book, second Corinthians. said, you better get this thing right. You know what we read uh, uh, about the church in Corinth, what we know historically about the church in Corinth? They repented. <laughs> they realized that what Paul said was right and they'd better change. Now look at this passage. This is an interesting passage. This is in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, and verse 10. Look what it says. For the sorrow or the mourning that is of the will of God produces repentance, a repentance without regret. What happens when, when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to your life and mine and evidences the damage and danger that sin is doing, how it's ruining our life? What happens? Hopefully, Paul said, it'll lead to repentance. And you know what repentance is? Repentance means I was going this way and I realized I was going the wrong way. I turned around and I went in the complete opposite direction. Paul writes to the church in Corinth and says, listen, you better repent. You better go in a totally different direction or your life and that life of the church um, is not going to be effective in any way at all. Somebody once said, sorrow for wrongdoing, which leaves God out of the equation, is merely remorse. It's like that of Judas Iscariot. It's a melancholy compound of self-pity and self-disgust for what you've done. But it doesn't bring any healing or uplifting to your life. Well, I've met a lot of people like that. I've met a lot of people who have come up and said, you know, I'm sorry that I did that. You know what I like to say? Don't ever do it again. Do you notice that's what Jesus said to the woman who was caught in adultery? Oh, I'll forgive you, but don't do it again. <laughs> and this is what repentance is all about. We need to stop the direction we go. We need to go uh, in a totally different direction. But look what else this verse tells us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance. When something is produced and repentance is produced, what are we talking about here? Well, these people have turned around. They're going in a different direction. What, what are they doing, actually? They're becoming obedient to the word of God. When people really realize what sin is doing in their life and how it's damaging and destroying their life and they realize it, what do they become obedient to? They become obedient to the Word of God. I mean, if you'd had have known me when I was 22 years of age, you wouldn't have thought I was a bad guy. I didn't think I was a bad guy. I mean, I never robbed a bank or shot anybody or did anything like that. But I can tell you and my friends would tell you that my life changed dramatically. Now what changed my life dramatically? It was the Word of God. I stopped going the direction I was going, went in a different direction, and I became obedient to a book that I said was just a bunch of fantasy originally. And now I became believe this is God speaking to me. And how did it happen? Because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I can't fully explain the work of the Holy Spirit, but I can fully experience it. I can't fully explain how I'm going to get to heaven in a blinking of an eye, but I'm going to experience it because that's the wonder of the Bible. That's the amazing miracle of the teaching of the Bible. And you will find that throughout the Bible, like James, the half-brother of Jesus, in James 5, 30 through 15, he, he talks there about the wonder of what happens when we're obedient to the Word of God, the, the miracles that can take place when we're obedient to the Word of God. Not because I have the power to do it, but God can do it through the working of the Holy Spirit. But there's a third 
matter that he mentions here. Not only repentance, and not only obedience, but look at the last part of this verse. It talks about deliverance. For the sorrow or the mourning that's according to the will of God produces repentance without regret. Boy, that's wonderful. And it leads to salvation. Listen, I've in my years of being a pastor, I've met numbers of people who have been convicted about their sin. Just uh, last week, we were up in Columbia, South Carolina, and we were there at a celebration, and I met again a 93-year-old gentleman who, who I've known for a number of years. And as a young man, he was a very successful businessman. He just got married, and he had four kids, and he was enormously successful. Then one day he was sitting in church and God spoke to him and said, oh, you think you're somebody just because you're successful making a lot of money? Well, it doesn't impress me at all. And he was deeply convicted about that and his attitude about how impressed he was with himself. And he said he went home and talked to his wife and they fell on their knees and said, God, you've convicted me about my attitude. What do you want me to do? And you know what God said? I want you to go to Ethiopia and be a missionary. And this man, he's 93 years of age now, he went to Ethiopia and began a mission in Ethiopia with Sudan Interior Mission. Established a Bible school, some churches, went out villages and one, not he didn't, the Holy Spirit, thousands of people came to know Christ through this man's ministry. How did that happen? Well, it happened because he became repentant. Not only did he become repentant, but because he was repentant, he became obedient to the word of God. And God brought a great healing in his life, delivered him from being so proud of himself and realized if he's anybody, it's only because of the goodness of God. That's what God can do. That's what God wants to do. But there's one final issue that I, I, I want us to think about and consider here. And that's the consolation that comes about, the good, the great good that comes about when God speaks to our heart and reveals to us what sin is doing, the damage and danger that sin is bringing to our life. And there are several things I, I know that uh, you would be well aware of about this. And Paul, again, when he was writing uh, to this church in, in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, listen to this verse. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. You know, I read this verse and I thought about this verse. And I thought, you know what? There's something wonderful in this verse that I, I previously had not really recognized and seen. I, I knew it, but I'd not seen it. Blessed, wonderful, glorious be the God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. You know what mercy is? Mercy, the Bible said God is a God of love. He's a God of grace, great love, great grace, great mercy. Do you know what mercy does? Mercy gives you and me what we don't deserve. Yes, he does. Do you think you deserve to go to heaven? Do you think really that you deserve to have Christ die on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin? Not cover your sin, but cleanse your sin out of your life so that when you stand before the throne in heaven, because of what Christ has done, tearing sin out of your life, cleansing your life, you and I can go to heaven? How does that happen? Well, it says because we have a God as a God of all mercy. God gives us what we don't deserve. <laughs> we get mercy from God. That's how we get into heaven. Because God is a God of mercy and he sent his son to pay a price for your sin and my son and cleanse us so that we can get into heaven. You know, when you look at the Old Testament... And even in the New Testament, and you look at some of the great people in the Old Testament, Abraham, David, and Ruth, Hannah, and Mary in the New Testament, and Peter, and Paul. You know what? They, they were people who what? Wept over their sin. 
and discovered the mercy of God because they were looking for a Messiah who would pay the price of their sin. You find it all throughout the Bible. And one of the consolations that we get, one of the wonders that we get when we realize the damage that sin can do in life, we want to be rid of that sin. You know what we get? We get pardon. You know, when you, I've never been to court, but if you do go to court and you're being charged with something, you know what you want to hear? You're not guilty. Isn't that what you want to hear? <laughs> Can you imagine standing in the throne room of heaven and you see hell over here and heaven over here and you want to go to heaven and you want to hear not guilty? And God sitting on the throne says, my friend, because you received my son as your saviour who's torn away your sin, I pardon you, you're not guilty. Welcome into my heaven. Man, <laughs> is not pardon a wonderful thing? And we get the pardon of God because of the mercy of God. But there's something else that's very important too. In Luke's gospel, I, uh, this was something we could easily miss, but there's a wonderful person all the time in the Bible. We have these people who step onto the pages of, of the Bible that we've never heard of before, we never hear again, and they're incredible people. And we read about one of these people by the name of Simeon. You may know the name. And here we find this guy. It just steps on the pages of, of history in the Bible in Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. And this is what we read of this man. Uh, maybe I'll read the whole passage to you. You won't grasp what's going on. And when the days of purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they, this is the parents of Jesus, brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him before the Lord. And as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male who opens the womb of a woman shall be called holy to the Lord. And they offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young uh, pigeons. Now listen to this verse. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was a righteous and holy and devout man. And he was looking for the consolation of Israel. He was looking for peace of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he'd seen the Lord Christ, before he'd seen the Messiah. Now what is said of the Messiah? Well, you know, in, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, what do they say of the Messiah? Well, they say of him, for a child shall be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government shall rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Eternal Father, but he will be the Prince of Peace. You know what the world is looking for? You know what I find that people are looking for? Yeah, they're looking for pardon. They want to be pardoned for their sin. But one of the greatest things the world is looking for today is peace. Now, people think that peace is some kind of practice. They think it's some kind of political order. You can sit down and arrange for peace. Let's practice peace. You can't practice peace. That's ridiculous. You know what peace is? It's not a practice. It's a person. And the Bible said until you have that person in your life who deals with the sin in your life, you will not have peace in your life or in this world. Blessed are those who mourn because they shall be comforted. Here's this man, Simeon, holy man, a godly man, a devout man. What's he looking for? Not the practice of peace. He's looking for the person of peace. And God said, because you are a holy man, a devout man, I won't let you die until you see Christ himself. For 2,000 years up until this time, the Jews have been looking for peace. Now it's 2,000 years later. What are we looking for today? Peace. We're looking for peace. How are we going to find it? We can have all the diplomacy that you want. You can ramp up as many activities of the United Nations as you can think of. But we will not have peace 
until we know and we honor the person. He's the giver of peace, Jesus Christ. But there's one other thing that I want to close with this morning. Not only do we get the Father's pardon and the Father's peace, but we also get the Father's power as well. If you were to talk to people about the book of John and say, what's the favorite verse that you have in the book of John? You know what they'll probably say? John 14, 6. Where Jesus said, I am the way to God, the truth about God and the life from God, and no man will ever make it to heaven unless they know my Father. But there's another verse in that chapter that I think is an exciting verse. It's not verse 6, but it's verse 16. John 14, verse 16. This is what it says. Jesus said, I promise you, I will go and ask the Father and he will give you another comforter. And that comforter will be with you forever. What is that comforter that he's promising? It's the Holy Spirit. Why is God saying to you, you need the Holy Spirit? Because you don't have the strength to live life without the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why you can get all the education you want. You can be under the, some of the greatest leaders that ever walked upon the face of the earth. But you won't have power to live like Christ unless you have the Holy Spirit working in your life. It was Jesus on the Mount Olivet when he was being lifted up into heaven and said, listen, when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. How was it that the early Christians were so good at sharing the gospel? Oh, you say, well, they had such great personalities. <laughs> no. Oh, they were so wonderfully educated. No. Where did they get their courage to do what they did? Listen, we talk about the Western world. What is it that's made the Western world of the three worlds we talk about? The Western world, the middle world, and the third world. Why is the Western world so different from the other two? Amazingly different. Because of Christianity. That's why. The teachings in the Bible. That's why. And it wasn't because these early Christians were that amazingly gifted or amazingly well educated or wealthy. What was the power of their courage? It was the Holy Spirit. Listen, the Bible tells us if we haven't dealt with this issue, if we haven't mourned over our sin, we haven't really begun to know the change in character we can have in our Christian life. I want to close with this story, and it's a, a, a true story. Many years ago, there was a man who became the chaplain of Princeton uh, University when it was a theological seminary. It was a Christian university, because it's not anymore. But after the Second World War, uh, there was a man by the name of Ernest Gordon, and he became the chaplain. He was the chaplain there for 25 years, and he's written a lot of books. You may have read some of his books. Brilliant, brilliant fellow. Wonderful chaplain. And if you go to Princeton University, you'll see things all around the university talking about this guy, but he's been dead for a long time. But they still honor him and say he was the greatest chaplain. He changed this university more than anybody else. How do you think that happened? When he was an 18-year-old young man, he was sent to fight in, in the Philippines <laughs> against the Japanese. He was captured by the Japanese. He was taken to Burma. And he was involved, like many Americans were, in building the, the Burma uh, Railroad. He became very, very ill. He, he was 20 by this stage. He became very, very ill. And he was in a Japanese prison camp. He almost died. And in that prison camp, there was a man by the name of Dusty Miller. He was the chaplain. Now, Ernest Gordon at this stage was a Christian, but not a strong Christian. But he came out of the ministry of this man, Dusty Miller, a chaplain, about a 50-year-old man. It happened that Ernest Gordon became so weak that he almost died and Dusty Miller began to share some of his food with him and some of his water with him. And once a week they got milk and he would give him all of the milk that he had. Well, there came a day where Ernest Gordon said to Dusty Miller, you might as well stop. You need this nourishment as much as I do and I'm going to die. 
Dusty Miller said, son, let me tell you something. And this was the words that he shared. He said, listen, young man, a man can experience an incredible amount of pain and of suffering as long as he has hope. But when he loses hope, he will surely die. That moment for Ennis Gordon changed his life. He realized that he was trying to make it in his own strength. And he became better. He did survive the war, became the chaplain of Princeton. And many times what drove him in the ministry that he had was, God broke me that moment. I realized that I was trusting myself to survive. And then I realized that unless you have hope in Jesus, you're not going to make it. I want to ask you this morning, how are you doing as a Christian? I mean, do you understand that you can't continue living uh, allowing sin to govern the leadership of your life? God's got a special plan for your life. Greatly enriched are those who have been broken over their sin. For well, they'll be comforted, they'll be changed, they'll be enriched in a new direction of life that can't be measured by anything but the future. You know, as I read and study the Word of God, I constantly am amazed at how wonderful, yet how simple the teachings of the Word of God are. And it'd be my prayer today, it has been this week, that God would just fall upon this church that he would cause us as a people to realize how much we need God. That we don't lose hope. Because as long as we have hope in the Prince of Peace, we can reach this world for Christ. We can win this world to understand the real purpose and plan that God has for each one of them. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for the opportunity this morning. You're looking at this simple beatitude. And the simple truth that this beatitude holds of how it is that, Lord, I can't live the Christian life, but Christ can, and Christ wants to live the Christian life through me. And Father, I would pray that this morning that you would speak to us about this whole issue of life and the sin in our life, and that we would come to the point of saying, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Deal with this issue in my life. Help me to understand that, Lord, I need repentance and obedience that I might be delivered from believing I can do it without your help. Lord, I pray for this church and for each one of us who are members here that you would lead us and that you would guide us and cause us to have great expectation, great hope in what God can do. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. As we sing this invitation hymn, I, I, I be praying that God is speaking to each one of us as he's been speaking to me this week about this issue. And if God is speaking to you this week, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, why not do it today? If you need to recommit your life, you could do it today. Maybe you're looking for a church home and you need to be a member of a church. The Bible says we need to make a habit of being in God's house, a member of a church. If you've never been baptized, you need to be. It's important. After receiving Christ, that's the next most important step is getting baptized, committing your life fully, publicly uh, to Jesus. As we sing this invitation to him, if God is speaking to you about any of these areas uh, and you want to come and share it with me, you don't have to do it in the invitation. You can do it after the church, but if you'd like to do it during the invitation so others can see your commitment, that would be wonderful. So let's stand together then. As we sing the closing hymn and as we sing, if God speaks to you, step out, you come while we sing.